Welcome back to Applied Materials and Corrosion. I've got a pen down here. So carrying on from where we left off, we're imagining a metal in some kind of electrolyte. That was our general situation. And in the easy situation that we had, we had some copper, and the copper was, without any surface layers, completely interacting with the solution. But we're more interested in other things right now. So for today, we're interested in what happens to other metals. So what if we've got some aluminium? What is going to happen? And you know really from other courses and from normal life, what is likely to happen, there will be some kind of layer of aluminium oxide on this weirdly red aluminium. And there will be some kind of process that will depend on what's in this solution. So uh, normal life, if this is tap water, pretty much nothing will happen. Our aluminium is gonna sit there and do nothing. If it's seawater, it will corrode, not super fast, but it'll corrode. If it's the inside of the dishwasher, which is highly basic water, it will go black and corrode away fairly awfully. If it's acid, it will also corrode very quickly. So we can see that there's going to be some kind of pH dependent reaction. And what we already know is that it's not the reaction between the metal and the base. It's the reaction between the metal and the liquid. That is, that is what we're actually seeing. And the oxide layer, protecting it or not protecting it, is what is governing how fast our reaction is. What we're going to use to talk about this or to describe our situation far better, is a type of phase diagram. What you'll be used to, to will be a variety of phase diagrams. So this is the type of solid, solid, liquid phase diagram. So we've got two different materials on the bottom. I've not described what this one is. They're mixing into each other. There's some kind of, um, there's some kind of mixture that will solidify in the middle and we've got phases on the outside of mixed materials here this one isn't soluble at this lower temperature is soluble at this higher temperature and then above this it's all liquid so this is a fairly standard um, two solid phase diagram above here we've got liquid below here we've got solid here we've got this solid up here we've got a solid and a liquid at the same time um, you may be familiar with those if you're not, maybe we can think of it in terms of distillation. So we have distillation. We would have, for example, um, pure water up here at 100 degrees, pure ethanol here at um, 70 something degrees, 74 or something. And we get a lens shape in between. Um, it goes down like that. And this one goes up like this. So we get a lens shape in between where we boil it and we get this composition of gas at the top and when we condense it we get a different composition of liquid so that that's where the distillation occurs. So we've got a, a gas line and a liquid line to uh, describe distillation. It's a, maybe a type of phase diagram that chemistry people are more familiar with. The other type is more familiar to material scientists. This is a ternary phase diagram. So in this one, temperature is the y-axis and composition is the x-axis. In a ternary phase diagram, we've got three things. So we've got, in this case, soap, which I haven't defined because um, I made it up, water and oil, which I also haven't defined because I made the diagram up. And here we would expect to see two phases in here where the oil and the water don't mix at very high concentration of oil, so mostly oil with a tiny amount of water, we get just one phase, which is oily phase. And down here, with water with a tiny amount of oil in it, we get just one phase, which is a watery phase, which is with a tiny amount of oil in. If we add soap to it, if we add enough soap, we can get it to mix in this particular case. So just soap and water or oil in any mixture is one phase. So there's a no vertical line down to there. So this is all one phase. It's not the same 
comp composition so we can move around in this single phase to very oily or to very watery or to very soapy and get different compositions but we only get one liquid in here we get two phases which would be in this case oily and the watery phase with soap in one or the other or both so what we can see from those two phase diagrams is that we have some kind of composition and we can vary what the other axes are this is a weird kind where it's got three axes and it makes it all odd in shape because this is not to 100 this is not to 100 this is not to 100 and then the hole in the middle has um, three components to it so now i've drawn a diagram for aluminium and it is an unusual type of phase diagram. Our y-axis is E, the electromotive force in volts. And our x-axis is pH, which is concentration of H+, plus, but the log of the concentration of H+, plus, negative. And we can see different phases on our diagram. We've also got these two dotted lines across, which we will discuss in a moment. First of all, we can think about the vertical scale. So if we make our aluminium <coughs> more and more uh, negative, we could theoretically get to a point where aluminium zero is stable. We can't do that in water because aluminium reacts with water. Aluminium is not thermodynamically stable in water, and this is a thermodynamic diagram, just like all phase diagrams are. So um, just like steel phase diagrams are used to predict kinetic outcomes this is a phase diagram which shows thermodynamic outcomes but we're going to use it to predict kinetic outcomes so if we sit here we don't need to worry about kinetics we're thermodynamically stable that would be the case inside an aluminium smelter and we make it reducing enough we can't have water in there the water would react with it but it's a, an aluminium salt and it is reducing and we're making aluminium and it's perfectly happy there's nothing going to happen it will turn to aluminium zero and nothing new will happen ever you can sit there and that will be it that's the final stage we're thermodynamically at equilibrium if we are at this low ph i haven't written many numbers on it i should probably have done but if we're at this low ph and we go we allow it to get to a normal voltage which is actually up here in water, then it, our thermodynamic endpoint would be aluminium 3 plus, that would be where we would expect all of our aluminium to go eventually, um, or most of it at least. And uh, obviously, we're going to corrode our aluminium away. If we're across here in this type of uh, situation, then we are more likely to make aluminium oxide, Al2O3. But remember, it's a thermodynamic diagram. So this is predicting that all of our aluminium will turn into aluminium dioxide. Aluminium 2 trioxide. If we make it even more basic still, we end up with a hydroxy group on there effectively. So this is the alum aluminate anion. So we've effectively reacted it with AlOH and um, made water. We've made, taken two hydroxy anions. We've made water and we've... Uh, three hydroxy anions. We've made water and we've made this aluminate anion. And this is soluble in water. So that's why in my dishwasher, aluminium is really unstable because we're here. And if we are in an acid, aluminium is unstable because we're here. Why is the pH significant? The pH is significant because of um, several things, but first of all, the reactions. So what do we expect to happen in water? Um, well, we've got two possibilities. So we've got H2O. And H2O can turn into hydrogen or oxygen so we can split our hydrogen off so we can have effectively H plus goes to to H plus 
goes to H2. And that's going to, obviously, we're going to add electrons in one direction and take them away in the other direction. And the other possibility is OH minus um, goes to oxygen. O2, we obviously need multiple ones of those. Let's have, uh, let's have water to do that. And OH, so it's going to do much the same reaction as this. Um, we're going to generate as a, a new water we're going to generate oxygen, and that will also transfer electrons. Those are two possibilities, but that's not the only thing that can happen in the water. We can also have dissolved oxygen, which would be the opposite of this reaction. So we can make oxygen, typically. Um, if we're doing electrochemistry, we might make oxygen, but we can also destroy oxygen and make OH minus which would happen if we have dissolved oxygen. So I've really got two things happening at once. This is my oxygen line. If I've got oxygen dissolved in my water, I've got oxygen that can react with H plus to form water, or water can form oxygen. So this would be an equilibrium line there. And this one is a reaction between um, H plus ions and electrons to form hydrogen. If we have aluminium, aluminium is more reactive than hydrogen, uh, so it will react with water to form hydrogen. That's why this line for aluminium, the stability line for aluminium, it's not straight, but the basic position, not position of it is lower than this hydrogen line. So it means that aluminium is more reactive than water. So um, as discussed, or as, no, it wasn't discussed, I just mentioned it earlier. As mentioned earlier, aluminium is not thermodynamically stable in water. It will eventually, according to thermodynamics at least, um, react forming hydrogen and aluminium salts. This line is at an angle because there are two H pluses in it. So the more acidic it is, the easier that reaction is to happen. And so the harder it is for the aluminium to stay below it. And uh, the easier it is for the aluminium to stay below it. It's more likely for hydrogen to form. So obviously the aluminium uh, can be higher and still be below it. If we're over here, we make it less likely for hydrogen to form. And so this line is at an angle. That's one useful thing. This one is also at an angle because, again, we've got the H plus in our reaction. So there's more H plus over here. So that's where the reaction is preferred. And over here, it's lower. The other thing that we can also see from these two lines is that vertical movement can, can occur with chemistry. So if we take these two points, let's take this point here and this point here, we can move around there. It doesn't do very much to the aluminium because the aluminium is down here. But if it was up here, it would have a strong effect. So we can move from this point down to this point just by bubbling nitrogen, through, for example, through our water and removing the dissolved oxygen. If we remove the dissolved oxygen, effectively, this reaction can't occur. And so we can go down to this one and allow um, the water to be stable unless we break it and remove hydrogen. We electrolyze it into oxygen and hydrogen. If there's dissolved oxygen and we're trying to reduce it, then uh, we're obviously going to be stuck on this line here instead. <coughs> In other examples, we might add oxidizing agents to come up higher and we might add reducing agents to remove the oxygen. Or we might be in fermentation, and we would see that we would go from a starting condition at the beginning of our beer brewing, for example, up here. And when we, as we brew the beer, the yeast gets going, it uses up the oxygen, and it comes down to slightly above this line, because there's still some oxygen in there, but not very much. So why is it good that we're measuring pH here? It's good because our voltage that we would expect, that's the voltage that we will actually generate, 
is dependent on the Nernst equation, which is this one. So the voltage is equal to the standard voltage, which is when everything is at one molar or in its standard state, one atmosphere, one molar, minus RT over ZF, so constant, apart from the Z, which is the number of electrons, multiplied by the LUN or the log, depending on whether you put a number in here or not, uh, of the concentration of reduced species divided by the concentration of oxidized species. And the pH is the minus log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. And so that very nicely drops two of these things out to make it a straight line. That's why there's a straight line in there. Otherwise, it would be a horrible curve all of the time. So it, it saves a lot of effort if we use the pH or the log of the concentration of something on this x-axis here, because it reduces the complexity of our diagram quite a lot, we can get the water lines in on their diagonals at a, with a certain gradient. The gradient is usually this z here. So here is an alternative diagram. It's a different metal. It's copper. And we can see the line for water here. So copper is unable to reduce water. It sits above water. So if we put copper zero into water, it can't destroy the water. That's already a good thing. It is, however, sus susceptible to oxidation by oxygen in the water. That is up here. Checking that I'm recording. That's up here. So if we have oxygenated water, our copper will turn into copper salts. And if we have deoxygenated water, nothing will ever happen. Thermodynamics is good for that. We are just stuck down here somewhere in this region. And it doesn't really matter where in that region we are, nothing can happen. If we get up to here, this is copper 1 oxide. And up here is copper 2 oxide. So we can see that in the case of copper, if we're at the pH in the middle here, then um, our copper will be kinetically stabilized. It will have a layer of copper 1 oxide with copper 2 oxide on top of it. And it can only corrode at the rate that that copper 2 oxide leaves our surface. If we make it more positive, it's obviously going to motivate it to react more. So if we're right up here, there's plenty of oxygen in our water, it will be more motivated to react and our copper oxide layer will be thicker. We'll get into that another time. If we make it very acidic, then we can make copper 2 plus ions directly of whatever acid it is. And if we make it very basic, we can make cuprate ions, copper hydroxide ions, directly. Those are the dark blue ones that you might have made in one of those chemical tests. If we don't oxidize it as much, then we've got weird copper one salts as well. So copper, like aluminium, is unstable both at acid and base ends. That's an interesting thing that it reminds us. But also more usefully, from a kinetic point of view, copper is thermodynamically stable against water, but it's kinetically stabilized it within this region here where the copper oxide can be formed. So in here, in this region of pH, as long as we stay in there. Um, so this is, that's what this pour by diagram, which I forgot to tell you what it's called. This is called a pour by diagram. Um, it's again, a type of phase diagram. These are the phases that we would expect if we waited forever. But what we're going to use it for is to predict what will happen to our surface. So if we've got our copper and we put it at low pH, we would expect to get a voltage about here and it will dissolve. If we take our copper and we put it into neutral pH, then um, nothing really will happen. It will form a copper oxide layer directly on the surface, and that will hinder its ability to do anything. If we make it really basic, then it will dissolve straight into the cuprate anion, but it's unlikely to do that quite basically. So um, with copper, we would tend to dissolve it with acid. If we use this diagram, if we need to use this diagram for something, we wouldn't be interested in 
what conditions are going to be the best for it. So we can imagine that this is a pH based diagram and this is only pH in this case that we've only got the effect of the hydroxide and the um, hydrogen ions. <coughs> but if we make it more complicated, we could put in some other ions to make the copper do something else. So we would end up with, just like in the soap example, we would end up with a stack of these for different substrates because we might expect copper to be more soluble in a solution that contains acetate ions, for example, than in a solution that contains sulfate ions. Why? Because copper forms sulfate, but it doesn't form sulfate complexes in solution, whereas co copper forms acetate complexes in solution, which may or may not be more soluble than the copper hydroxide and the copper oxide, so we really expect a difference anyway. And then we can go and look it up and see which one is better for our particular case if we're allowed to change that. If we've got a different problem that we're trying to address, which is the simple industrial uh, materials, like the materials engineer type problems, we've got these conditions that we're in C, and uh, is this copper going to last? we can see, no, it's not great. We're up here in oxidizing, we're going to form copper oxide, but because chloride is present, another graph, there will be problems. So these lines on our diagram, they come mostly from calculation, from thermodynamic calculation. You can measure in them, but we can just calculate them. This Nernst equation is the one that we would like to use to do most of the, of the work for us, and it will tell us what the voltage is for any process. But what we can see here is we have to make concentration choices. So if, for example, I should have left some of the diagram up, if, for example, we're doing the um, hydrogen line, we've got our H+, plus, which is defined by the pH, the concentration of H+, plus is defined by the pH there, but we've also got H2 in there, which obviously is not defined in a real case. It's bubbling off. And so we may need to make a decision. Um, so this is the reduced one. We need to make a decision in this case what concentration we're going to use to draw our diagram. In a real case, as I mentioned with our um, imaginary um, starting conditions, maybe a little while ago, we have a copper electrode and we dip it into some tap water. We end up with a problem. There is no oxidized form of copper in there. Let's choose tap water that's acidic for some reason. So we don't have to worry about the acid and we don't have to worry about other things happening. Uh, so we don't have to worry about the oxide. So we dip our copper into some mild acid there is no concentration of oxidized copper in there, and so our redox equation is a little bit undefined. We've got an, an infinity in there. That's a bit of a problem. And we can't really take the log of a, of a non-defined number. So uh, we've got a little bit of a problem in there. Immediately some of it dissolves, and then this voltage will change. We have exactly the same problem, so we can't do it for zero, but, but we will have to define a concentration. Very often they're defined as very low concentrations because we're interested in slow processes. Um, so our hydrogen is going to diffuse away in some way. If it's an implant, it's going to diffuse out through the body. Um, it could be a problem. It could be a, a definitely a problem inside the body. And so we might want to choose a low concentration for that. Just so that we can see, how can we keep it to this low concentration? So this line is not really a line, it's a whole series of lines at different concentrations that run parallel to each other. This is very often the case with these, so um, we are making several choices to draw the diagram, and it's important to be clear what assumptions we're making at that point. Um, so our water oxidation line, obviously, we're choosing the concentration of oxygen. 
which is in equilibrium with oxygen in the air, so one atmosphere. But we're also um, considering that that's very slow so that we can keep that concentration up so it doesn't dip down all the time. If we're dissolving our copper into solution, so that line, the horizontal line that was the copper dissolving into solution, we've chosen the value for the copper dissolving into solution to draw that line. It's really obviously a whole set of parallel lines for different concentrations because it's a thermodynamic diagram. So really what would happen is if we were at that potential, we would get a fixed concentration and it would stop. If we're at a different potential, slightly higher, we'd get a higher concentration and it would then stop. If we're slightly below it, so the line for the copper, copper zero, if we're slightly below the line that we've drawn, we get a lower concentration than whatever one we chose. We never get zero because it's doesn't work with this equation. In practice, we can get it so low that it's hard to measure the loss of copper, and then we can call it zero, but in mathematically we can't get zero because we can't solve the equation. So we've chosen some values to draw the lines, and we should bear that in mind when we're analyzing them because it means, oops, it means that slightly below the line doesn't mean that nothing happens, it means that there is less concentration at equilibrium than the one that we chose to draw the line. Okay, I think that's a lot of material for today because these poor by diagrams are traditionally difficult for students to get into their head. So I've just introduced them today and next time we will do some more. In fact, uh, I think I'll consider more what happens on the surface of the metal to, to make these oxide layers, for example.